My initial exposure to Humphrey Bogart was just about perfect. It was 1983, and my father bought a copy of Casablanca on video. Being a fledgling movie fanatic, I had read about both Bogart and Casablanca by that point, but seeing the movie for the first time was a magical experience. My admiration for Bogart as an actor was strengthened a year later when I was home sick from school and caught 1948's Key Largo on TV, one of four movies he made with his wife, Lauren Bacall. What was it about Bogart that appealed to me? To sum it up, I present the first paragraph from my review of Nicholas Ray's 1950 film In a Lonely Place, which featured one of Bogart's most underrated performances. For me, Humphrey Bogart was always a man's man, a rugged, tough-as-nails actor who played strong lead characters. But as I think back on some of his greatest performances, I see that initial perception only told half the story. Bogey was indeed at his best portraying strong leads, but many of these characters also had an inherent flaw or a vulnerability that only an actor of Bogart's stature could convincingly convey. Captain Quig in the Kane Mutiny was an experienced officer, yet his by-the-book approach, coupled with an acute paranoia, would force his second-in-command, Lieutenant Merrick, played by Van Johnson, to turn on him. But Quig is just the tip of the iceberg. Charlie Allnut from the African Queen was an alcoholic tugboat captain who was slow to act, and Fred C. Dobbs in the Treasure of Sierra Madre would let his greed get the better of him. Even Rick in Casablanca loses perspective when old flame Ilsa strolls into his gin joint, while Sam Spade from the Maltese Falcon carried on an affair with his partner's wife. You sense the strength in each and every one of these characters, but it's their weaknesses that make them so compelling. In real life, Bogart was a lot like the characters he portrayed. A loyal friend and a man of unwavering principles, Bogart could also be argumentative and was known to lose his patience with actors and directors from time to time. In the book Bogart, In Search of My Father, its author, Stephen Bogart, the actor's son, recounts a story told to him by director John Huston. It was during the making in 1948's The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Throughout the shoot, Bogart became increasingly annoyed with Huston's penchant for shooting scenes more than once, and the actor and director, who were longtime friends, clashed on more than one occasion. It all came to a head one night when Bogart, Houston, and Lauren Bacall sat down for dinner. Bogart grumbled that it was taking too long to shoot the movie and that he might miss the yacht race he wanted to enter in Honolulu. More than acting, Bogart loved the sail, and he would take his yacht, the Santana, out as often as he could. He pressed Houston to hurry things along, at which point the director reached across the table, pinched Bogart's nose between two of his fingers, and began to twist it. John, you're hurting him, Bacall snapped, to which Houston replied quite calmly, Yes, I know. I mean to. The next morning, Bogart apologized and agreed to do whatever was necessary to see the movie through to the end. The treasure of the Sierra Madre went on to become a classic, and Bogart missed the race. A cultural icon as well as a much-beloved actor, Humphrey Bogart remains to this day one of Hollywood's brightest stars, and I'm betting that a hundred years from now, he will shine just as brightly. I'm Dave Becker, and I love old movies. Hello, film historians. I'm Derek, and I love old movies. We've got Sam the Sidekick here. Hello, and welcome to episode 16, where we'll be continuing our all-war movie November. The big one-sixer. XVI, as it were, sir. Right off the bat, let's get a big shout-out to Dave Becker for this episode's cold open. Dave is a fellow podcaster whose accomplishments and renown are in a constant struggle with each other to see which, in fact, is greater. Totally. Not that you need us to tell you to go check Dave out at any of his podcasts, but definitely do that. Oh, yeah. And tell him that the gang over at ILOM sent you. 
We should mention exactly where our listeners can find him. Well, you can hear Dave on the Land of the Creeps podcast. And on the Horror Movie Podcast. That's so elegantly named. Right? I mean, you know what you're getting there. You can also check Dave out at his website, dvdinfatuation.com, where he posts a film review every day. As well as the accompanying solo podcast, DVD Infatuation, hosted by Considering the Cinema. So, big thanks, Dave. It was excellent having you on as part of the show. Now, that having been said, we had kind of a big moment last week. Oh, we did. Now, the podcast is on a lot of different platforms. It's a bit hard to keep track of it all. But you do. I do. And last Friday, we crossed 1,000 total listens. Yeah. Which we kind of felt was a big deal. It was kind of a big deal. I mean, obviously, there are pods that do that in a day. How many days did it take us? Like 99. Okay. So still some room for growth is what I'm hearing. There is, but the growth is happening. And let's be honest. That's because of you guys, our awesome listeners. You rock. You're cool. You put us to that 1,000 mark. And that's pretty neat. So keep listening, keep reaching out to us on the socials, keep spreading the word, and most importantly... Keep watching movies. Yeah. Let's do the socials thing. Oh, for sure. You can reach us on the Facebook. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Or the Instagram. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Maybe Twitter is more your thing. At Ilom Podcast. Or if all that fails, just send us a good old-fashioned email. I love old movies, the podcast at gmail.com. All one word. And while you're listening to this, please take a moment to hit like, subscribe, and share. Sharing makes a huge difference. I'll say. So, on previous episodes in our All War November, we have visited the deep waters of the Pacific Ocean. Run Silent Run Deep, episode 14. And the brutal, unforgiving European battlefields of No Man's Land. All Quiet on the Western Front, episode 15. And today, the endless sand and blazing sun of the North African desert. That's because today we are looking at the 1943 film Sahara, starring Humphrey Bogart. Let's get to work. Our director and co-writer is Zoltan Korda. Korda was born into a Jewish family in Hungary and was one of three brothers, all of whom became filmmakers. Korda first got into the film industry through one of his brothers, who took him to the United Kingdom to work with the London Films Production Company. He spent many years there working as a camera operator, film editor, and screenwriter. And in 1918, he directed two silent shorts in his home country, as well as a full-length feature film in Germany in 1927. He then made his English directorial debut with the film Men of Tomorrow in 1932. Three years later, he became well-known and respected after the release of the film Sanders of the River. That film was a commercial and critical success, and he even got his first nomination for Best Film at the Venice Film Festival. He later won that festival's award for Best Director, along Robert Flaherty, for Elephant Boy in 1937. Porta also made several military war films, and even filmed many of them in Africa or India. One of these films, The Four Feathers, in 1939, starring Sir Ralph Richardson, is seen as his greatest film. In 1940, Corda moved to Hollywood, where he remained for the rest of his career. He worked on seven more films with United Artists, including The Thief of Baghdad, Sahara, and A Woman's Vengeance, in 1947. He died in 1966, at the age of 61. The co-writer is John Howard Lawson. Primarily a playwright in the early part of his career, Lawson moved to Hollywood in 1928 and wrote scripts for films such as The Ship for Shanghai in 1930, Bachelor Apartment in 1931, and Goodbye Love, 1933. In 1933, Lawson helped to organize and become one of the first presidents of the Screenwriters Guild, and throughout the late 1930s and early 40s, Lawson wrote screenplays for several more films, including Blockade, 1938, Counterattack, 1945, and Sahara in 1943. In the 1930s, leftists attacked Lawson through the newspapers, calling him a bourgeois hamlet of our time, and accusing him of lacking political commitment. Due to the continued criticism, he officially joined the Communist Party in 1934. Lawson appeared before the House Un-American Committee in 1947, but refused to answer any questions. He became a part of the Hollywood Ten, who all claimed that the First Amendment gave them the right to do what they were doing. All ten were found guilty of contempt of Congress, and Lawson was sentenced to 12 months in prison 
and was blacklisted from writing in Hollywood. Afterwards, Lawson moved to Mexico and wrote several Marxist book adaptations of plays and films, such as The Hidden Heritage, 1950, and Film in the Battle of Ideas, 1953. He died in 1977 at the age of 82. I feel like I say this a lot, but in the annals of old Hollywood, there are stars, and then there are these huge, massive stars that it's hard to compare anyone else to. We've talked about a few of those. We have, and we're going to talk about another one. Probably my first ever favorite actor, and still a top five all time for me. I'm talking about the incomparable Humphrey Bogart. And before I begin, as always, let me stress, there is no way that I can do this man's career justice in the time we have available. All I can do is give you the broadest strokes. Born in New York City in 1899 and having early experience in show business as being the face of Gerber baby food, Bogart really caught the acting bug in the 1920s when he managed a small theater company, although his stage work was considered unimpressive. In 1930, he moved to Hollywood and got a contract with Fox, which led to five years of minor roles. In 1936, he moved to Warner Brothers and had a breakout role in The Petrified Forest. The film was a huge success and led to Bogart being in 28 films over the next four years, mostly playing gangsters. But his 1941 was one for the ages, as he appeared in classics such as High Sierra and The Maltese Falcon. Just sticking to the massive hits, he followed these with Casablanca in 42, The Big Sleep in 46, and Key Largo in 1948. In 1947, he joined his wife Lauren Bacall and other actors protesting the House Un-American Activities Committee witch hunts, and then formed his own production company, which made The Treasure of the Sierra Madre in 1948. Bogey won the Best Actor Academy Award for The African Queen in 51, and was also nominated for Casablanca and as Captain Quig in The Cane Mutiny in 1954. That was a film made when he was already seriously ill with the throat cancer that would claim his life in 1957. Now, Bogart's filmography is filled with renown and appears prominently on many lists made by the AFI. Greatest romances, most inspiring films, greatest films of all time, greatest film characters of all time. It just goes on. Seven of his films have been preserved by the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant and six of his films were nominated as Best Picture, just underlining the epicness of his career. I've watched so many of his films so many times, and I still find things to enjoy in them. Everyone should watch at least 10 Humphrey Bogart movies. Wow. And all that isn't even getting into his personal life, which was also something, right? Oh, I'll say. A passionate and accomplished sailor, an incredibly well-read man who quoted Plato, a gifted chess player who could hustle and beat pros for money, a hard-drinking type who formed the original Rat Pack with Frank Sinatra as part of his partying crowd, and a man whose last marriage, his fourth, to a young Hollywood starlet named Lauren Bacall, was almost worthy of a movie itself. Bogart was one of the true greats, and we lost him way too soon. You have those posters of them downstairs. Kid, I got those posters when I was younger than you. They have hung on a lot of walls. Fellow New Yorker J. Carol Nash appeared in over 200 films. A true supporting actor and frequently playing villainous roles, Nash scored a Best Supporting Actor nomination for Sahara, one of two from his career. Nash worked regularly in film and eventually television for 40 years, appearing in such features as Captain Blood, the Charge of the Light Brigade, House of Frankenstein, the Batman serial, Annie Get Your Gun, Rio Grande, and his final film, Dracula vs. Frankenstein, in 1971. Famed for playing characters of a wide range of ethnicities, Nash became known as Hollywood's One Man United Nations. Nash was also very successful on radio, playing the title character in Life with Luigi from 1948 to 1954 and also served as an uncredited narrator on several of his films, since he had such a rich speaking voice. One of the most versatile character actors in film history, Nash was never a star, but left behind a vast and varied body of work. He passed away in 1973 at the age of 77. The story of Sahara is the story of how the studio system and the ability to loan out contracted performers to other studios made Humphrey Bogart one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. See, in those days, actors, or at least the really big names, weren't free agents, able to sign on with whatever film they wanted. 
They were contracted to specific studios, which meant they would turn up in their films exclusively for the length of their contract. Unless they were loaned out. Unless they were loaned out. And that's what happened here? I thought Bogart was always a Warner Brothers guy. He was, but Sahara was made by Columbia. See, once Bogart had enjoyed a string of hits, he had the fortunate timing of his contract expiring. He had no problems re-signing with Warner, but he had a perk in his contract that would allow him to make one film per year with an outside studio. Now, Bogart already had a bit of a reputation of taking on films that other actors had passed on. George Raft, we are mostly looking at you here. And Sahara had been passed on by Gary Cooper, Glenn Ford, and Brian Donlevy. They certainly weren't the stars that Bogart was, though. And this was Columbia's problem. They couldn't really match the other studios in terms of star power. And star power sells tickets. But part of the problem was Columbia head Harry Cohn, who had a bad reputation in Hollywood and who few actors wanted to work with. Why would Bogart choose to work there, then? Well, that's the thing. Bogey loved the guy, so he was eager to go work for Columbia, and he did so using up a lot of his one-time-a-year slots to make films with them. That must have been great for Columbia. It was. Despite him not being under contract for them, Bogey became their biggest star, and we got some great films of the, out of the collaboration. In addition to Sahara, some gems like Knock on Any Door and The Harder They Fall, which was actually Bogey's last film. And what did the critics and audiences think about Sahara when it came out? I'm guessing they liked it more than the made-for-TV remake with Jim Belushi. Uh, yeah, they sure did. Critics were very favorable to the film, especially praising Bogart's portrayal of Sergeant Gunn. Variety's review at the time said that the script is packed with pithy dialogue, lusty action and suspense, and logically and well-devised situations avoiding ultra-heroics throughout. It's an all-male cast, but the absence of romance is not missed in the rapid-fire unfolding of vivid melodrama. Why not just say it's realistic and great? Well, you gotta sell those industry magazines. Yeesh. So what's the tale of the tape on this one, Sam? So we have a 7.5 on IMDb. Okay. The audience score is 86% on Rotten Tomatoes, and the tomato meter is 100%. Boom. The film won no awards, but it was nominated for three Oscars. And for this one, you're gonna have to head over to your local secondhand DVD store. We open on a title card with Humphrey Bogart's name, and that's before the title of the movie. Let's get that star's name right up front there. Sell the sizzle, not the steak. Hey, Lloyd Bridges is in this. And friggin' Dan Durier. Does that make him the fourth actor that has appeared in more than one film that we've covered? Burt Lancaster, uh -huh. Bella Lugosi. Yeah, Lionel Atwell. And now Dan Durier. Yeah, I loved him in Too Late for Tears. Episode two, folks. Go back and check it out. It's 1942, and American tanks are helping the British fight in the North African desert. We see a battlefield and a besieged tank named Lulu Bell. They're given orders to scram, but the tank needs repairs. Sergeant Gunn, played by Bogey, is in command, and shells are going off all around them. They manage to get the tank started and head south, the only direction without enemy presence. But there's nothing there but sand. Gunn has only two men left. His radio operator Jimmy and machine gunner Waco. The rest are dead. And while retreating, they encounter some British soldiers and a doctor who are the survivors of a Stuka attack on a field hospital. The British don't want to retreat. Gunn calls it following orders, and he believes in his tank. The British decide to follow rather than be overrun by the Germans. As the soldiers get better acquainted, Lulu Bell breaks down in the middle of the desert, necessitating more repairs. It seems that gasoline shouldn't be a problem but they are beginning to get concerned about water. The British agree to have Gunn be in charge, since the only one of them that outranks him is a doctor, and he might not make the best battlefield decisions. Continuing on, they find a Sudanese soldier with an Italian prisoner. Grand Central Station, Sahara Desert Edition. Sergeant Major Tambul is the last survivor of a wiped-out company, but he took a prisoner, and he knows the way to a well. The prisoner, Giuseppe, really wants to come with them and shows pictures of his baby and wife. He speaks English and is willing to help them. He's desperate to not be left in the desert. And cue the wartime disdain for Axis soldiers and the sort of line that probably wouldn't make the final cut of a film today, as Gunn decides to leave the prisoner behind, saying, I'm not taking on a load of spaghetti. So they just leave him there. Oh, 
This is terrible. Humphrey Bogart, no. Giuseppe gathers his things and watches them leave. And with no hope, he walks after them, following their tracks. But thankfully, racked by the sense of guilt brought on by his own humanity, Gunn has a change of heart and they take Giuseppe on. See, kids? The Allies are the good guys. I like how they got that subtle message in there. A Messerschmitt on patrol spots the tank and attacks, strafing them with machine gun fire. But the tank fires back and blows the plane out of the sky, although the pilot has time to bail out. The pilot wants the tank crew and British to surrender to him since they have no hope of survival. That is pretty nervy. He tells them about the fall of Tobruk, which is unnerving to the Allied soldiers. And they learn that one of the British soldiers, the one played by Lloyd Bridges, was wounded in the attack. So now we have three Americans. A Frenchman, an Italian, a Sudanese, a German, a few British, and a South African, all riding a tank through the desert. They press on to the well, now with two prisoners and a wounded man. They keep getting more and more people. It's like that book about the guy that keeps getting hats. What? Y you know, that guy. And he keeps getting hats, and he needs to pile them on top of everything. The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins. Yes! By Dr. Seuss. Yes, that's the one. This is just like that. But in the war. On a tank. And with people. Like I said. Uh, they get to the first well, and they find that it's a dried-up sand hole. Oof. The wounded soldier dies, and a new set of orders come through the radio. Reform lines, defend Cairo and Alexandria at all costs. A sandstorm comes in, and Lulu Bell struggles to keep going. They reach the next well, which has a little stone house built over it, and they shelter there. Why is everyone struggling walking in the storm but the Nazi? Why is it a stroll in the park for him? That's really weird. It's like when Legolas is walking over the snow in Caradas. In the morning, the storm is over, and Lulu Bell is half buried in sand. The men search for the well, and Tambul finds it, but the well is dry. But down at the bottom, there is a drip of water through the rocks. It's not much, but it's a lot more than nothing. Quickly, they set to go gathering as much water as they can. Every man gets three swallows of water. Even Giuseppe and the pilot. Meanwhile, a column of Nazi soldiers and vehicles, also struggling with water so shortage, have found Lloyd's grave marker. They decide to head to the same well that the boys are at. Harvesting the water is very slow, since the water is just a trickle. Giuseppe helps repair the tank. He was a mechanic before the war. He hates Mussolini, and it's clear he is not interested in the politics, nor the realities of the war. He just wants to go home. The men all talk and bond while waiting for the water. Frenchy is an interesting guy. He really likes his wine and cheese, and does an elaborate pantomime of eating and drinking. That's quite a rich and nuanced character. No stereotyping at all. He does this for a really long time. Oh, and he pretends there's onions, too. The Italian and German prisoners are sequestered together, and the German soldiers are arriving at the well, wanting the water. A half-track pulls up to the well site, and there's a brief fight, and some of the Germans are killed, but two are captured. Gunn uses the water as leverage to get the thirstier German to talk and explain where his unit is. It turns out there are 500 men on the way to claim the well and take the water. 500 is a lot. And at that moment, the well goes dry. Gunn hatches a plan. They'll release the Germans so they'll report back and explain that there is water. Then they will hold up the 500-man column for as long as they can, preventing them from joining the attack on Cairo, I suppose. He shares a big inspirational pep talk to get everyone on board for this suicidal scheme. Waco takes the German half-track and tries to reach the British line, while the British and Giuseppe and Joe build trenches and fortifications. And maybe a machine gun nest or two to defend against the incoming 500 men. Well, it is war. And cue the 500 Germans. Like ants at a picnic. This is like 300, on a smaller scale, in World War II, and also in the desert. Once the Germans get close enough, Lulu Bell and the machine guns open up. And it is a rough time for the German soldiers. The Germans retreat, but when the shooting stops, Stegman, the South African, is dead. Two Nazis approach under a white flag. They want the well, and they offer to let the Allies leave unharmed. Gun counteroffers with a guns-for-water deal. They don't reach an agreement. 
Meanwhile, Waco's broken down in the half-track and continues on foot. Because he is a badass. He's bound to bump into someone. It's been established that people bump into each other all the time in this desert. At the siege, German snipers try to thin the ranks, and Williams is killed. Gunn is quickly running out of men. And at night, a full attack is on. The pilot wants to use the confusion to escape, but Giuseppe won't help him. He delivers an epic speech about Hitler and how absolutely evil he is. The pilot is furious and asks if he is insulting Hitler. Giuseppe says, that would take an artist. I'm a mechanic. What a great line. Yeah, so good. That character is great. The pilot kills Giuseppe, then makes a run for it. And Tambul chases him down. Once he catches the pilot, Tambul buries his face in the sand, smothering him. But then Tambul is killed by a ridiculous amount of gunfire. So many bullets. All the bullets. There's a second parlay, and Gunn's men fake bathing. They can just bathe, you see, because they have more water than they know what to do with. It's quite a ruse. The Germans offer to stop attacking in exchange for water. And the Gunn's for water offer is repeated. Frenchie is shot during the parlay, and Gunn totally machine guns the German commander, and most of their front line. I'd say at this point, there won't be any more negotiation. Meanwhile, Waco is still walking. And walking. Back at the scene, Jimmy is wounded, and he and the doctor retreat into the building, which is then hit by mortar shells and collapses onto them, crushing both instantly. What? That was shocking. That was really shocking. But it harkens back to the beginning, when the doctor talked about the Stuka bombing the field hospital. See, those Nazis? They strike at the weak and the wounded. They have no honor. Was every war film basically a propaganda film back then? Yeah, totally. Waco is reduced to crawling, but he is found by a British crew in a jeep. Of course he is. I knew it. Gunn and Osmond brace for the final attack. The Germans advance, but they aren't attacking. They're surrendering. And the well is now filled with water. The mortar shells reopen the well and there's a ton of water. So they capture all the Germans who have surrendered and let them have all the water they want. The British arrive soon with a column of tanks and jeeps and men, and Lulu Bell motors out to meet them, having captured a ton of German soldiers. Waco and Joe are reunited, and we see the graves of all the dead allies back at the well. We learn that the British held at Al Alamein, possibly in part due to the German column not getting there to help. Bogey says the names of the fallen soldiers, heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice. And that's the end. That was fun. For sure. Let's pro and con this bad boy. Take it away. Okay. So my pros. Number one, J. Carol Nash's performance as Giuseppe is a classic example of how to maximize your minutes on screen to make a lasting impact. From the moment we meet him until he uses his dying breath to warn Sergeant Gunn of the pilot's escape, Giuseppe is a fascinating character with a worldview that we can get behind. He's on the other side in this war. But he's not the enemy. He's a regular man, caught up in the politics and conflict that are not his own. Nash is one heck of an actor, and he steals every scene he is in with breathtaking ease. Number two, the cinematography. The movie rises to its limitations really well. Shot nowhere near the actual Sahara, the crew did a great job of recreating desert conditions, allowing the camera work to really shine. The camera work sells the brutality of the desert conditions, the never-relenting heat and thirst and the toll it takes on the men. The camera sees it all, at distance and intimately close. It's just a well-shot film. And three, the battle scenes. The shelling at the beginning and the tank versus fighter plane fights are fun. But it's the scaled-down version of the Battle of Thermopylae that really sells this film. The small, indomitable force playing defense against a superior foe always makes for a great tale. And they tell it, and more importantly show it, very well here. My cons. There are several times in the film that people bump into each other in the middle of the desert. Deserts are vast, and there weren't roads to follow. That many chance encounters just didn't seem realistic and took away from the film. Two. The pacing is a bit weird in this film. From the leisurely retreat in the beginning to the slow trudge through the desert to the well to the breakneck finish with the intense battle scenes of the siege of the fortified well, the pacing is just all over the place. It seems like they were going for a slow burn before realizing they need to pick up the pace at the end. 
I liked the slow build, but I'd like to have seen it paid off with an even longer battle scene that could really wring the passion out of every moment. Number three, Lloyd Bridges. While it's always neat to see an early appearance of an actor that went on to have an excellent career and have sons who have had excellent careers, why he was cast as a British soldier who was just there to die quickly seemed more like a contractual obligation than an attempt to cast the role effectively and authentically. In a movie where a lot of the other casting is a huge strength, Bridges' inclusion is a bit of a letdown here. His British accent is bad, his hair is all wrong, and his character is pointless. And is this a watch? Yeah. It's maybe not essential viewing, but it's certainly enjoyable and entertaining. Fair enough. You're up. Okay, so my pros. One, people talking in different languages. I really like films that have different characters speaking their own language instead of speaking English with an accent. I like it even more when they don't put in subtitles. Because if the other characters don't know what they're saying, why should we? It just makes it seem more real and authentic, so I appreciated that part of the film. 2. Giuseppe. I loved him. I was so sad when Humphrey Bogart just wanted to leave him. He was just trying to show him the picture of his family. And the way he fought back against the stupid Nazi was excellent. He got some really good digs in and just went off on that jerk. It really solidified that he was just this good guy who wasn't willing to betray the other soldiers who had treated him well and kept him alive. 3. Tricking the Germans with the water. I just thought this was really clever. They pretended that they were using the water to bathe and led the Germans to believe that they had more than enough water to go around. This was smart and a really sneaky plan, and I liked it. When they did that bit about the bathing, I actually gasped because I was so shocked and impressed at that plan. My cons. 1. Finding people in the desert. I feel like there was a bit much of this going on. Seriously, it happened so many times. It was like every 20 minutes, a new person or group of people were being added onto the tank. It was kind of funny that they just kept piling up but it was kind of repetitive and unnecessary. Once or twice would have been fine, but after like the fifth time, it became a bit much. Two. The tank. It was just so ugly and loud. I understand that it's a tank, so it's going to be loud, but it was just a huge pile of junk. It was all blocky and square and chunky. It was just not enjoyable to look at, but since it was obviously a very important part of the movie, I had to look at it a lot. Plus, it kept breaking down all the time. The most unreliable tank I've ever seen. 3. Waco. Seriously, this guy had one freaking job. <laughs> like, five minutes after he left, he crashed the car so it couldn't be used. And, I mean, he kept going, so that was cool of him. But he was just slowly walking through the desert as he ran out of water. I mean, sure, in the end they were able to get the reinforcements after the battle, but no thanks to this guy. He literally passed out, and it was only by sheer luck that other British soldiers happened to see him. That's all very true. Um, And is this a watch for you? It definitely is. Okay. Well, uh, just like that, we come to the end of another episode. We sure do. This was a fun one. They're all fun, but it was fun doing a bogey film. That seemed a bit overdue for us. Oh, yeah. What do you think, listeners? Should we do more Bogart films? What's one that you would like to see us take on? Let us know in the comments. Now, next week, we are going to be looking at the incredible true story of the most decorated U.S. soldier of World War II. A hero so renowned that when they made a movie about his life, they had to get him to play, well, him. And we will have a special guest from the Above and Beyond podcast to put this man and his heroics into perspective for us. It's worth getting excited about right now. So go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, be sure to take a moment to let people know about this podcast and what a great time they would have listening to it. Absolutely. You doing that is the way we grow. So don't keep us all to yourself. We are not a secret. So tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They might like hanging out at a dried up well in a desert as much as you do. (laughs) Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies.
Additional research for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, is done by Nikki Weatherden. Audio clips come from prefx.co.uk. Images are used through the provisions of fair use, and our theme song, Burning Bridges, is by The Crocs.